So to to try to reiterate a little bit about where where we've come, we are asking. One can think of what we're doing as asking some fundamental questions about the world. We're asking, how can we understand the world? How can we understand history, where we're at right now? Um, and beyond that, how can we understand reality? Are there different ways of understanding reality that seem contradictory on the face of it, but are nevertheless compatible um, in, in some strange way, like, like particles and waves are compatible even though they seem contradictory? Uh, so how can we understand the world uh, we also want to know what should we do as a result of that understanding? What is our obligation um, in the face of reality as we understand it? Um, and what can we hope for as, as a result of, of what we do? So these are the, the fundamental questions that we're, that we're addressing. And we began um, these sessions by trying to establish a little bit of a historical context. Um, and uh, and of understanding the, the dislocation and confusion uh, of the present in terms of our passing through a transitional period in human civilization. We are passing through our turbulent adolescence, uh, coming from childhood and emerging at some point, not yet, clearly, uh, but at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future, emerging into, uh, into maturity. And just as in adolescence, our bodies start to change first, and then our mental and spiritual development catches up to it later, in the world as well, in this great period of transition, which is taking centuries, uh, what we might call this greater enlightenment, of which the, the enlightenment that we study in the history books was just one chapter, our material circumstances changed first, and our spiritual horizons are only now expanding to catch up. So we have a great deal to look forward to in the future. And, and we know that the future will not be like the past. Um, and also in the same way that the problems of adolescence cannot be solved by reimposing the rules of our childhood, the problems of our present cannot be solved by appealing to the solutions of the past, to the solutions of our collective spiritual childhood. And so we've been looking at the Baha'i writings for inspiration and clues about the spiritual worldview of the future, of our collective maturity, which will necessarily be different from that of the past. And we're asking what might this worldview look like? What might some of the elements of it be? And we began by trying to establish the historical context. How did we come to arrive at this present moment? And then yesterday, how is our understanding of the physical world transformed recently, uh, recently on the world stage. And we look briefly at the principles of relativity, of complementarity, and of symmetry, which form the pillars of the edifice of modern physics. And we drew some suggestive parallels with spiritual principles embedded within the Baha'i writings. Today, we'll turn from the physical to the metaphysical. And our starting point will be one of the great insights from the scientific enterprise, uh, which is an insight that arises from the scientific method itself rather than from the results of the application of that scientific method. And that is this profound realization that no theory is final. There's always uncertainty. There's always the edge of the unknown where unexpected results may completely overturn established ideas. Uh, a great example of this, one could find many examples of this in science, but one uh, particularly spectacular example of this in science was the, the transition from the old Newtonian view of understanding the universe to the, the view of the universe uh, embodied in Einstein's uh, theory of, uh, of uh, theories of special and general relativity. There are a couple of one might ask, what is the difference between these two theories, the theory of Newton's theory and Einstein's theory, which are so completely different from each other in their formulation and in their views of the nature of space and time and mass and energy and their relationships. What is the difference between these, those two theories in terms of the world that we observe on an everyday basis? Uh, and the answer is, there is actually no difference between them. 
one cannot measure the difference between these two theories in terms of our everyday, our, our, our everyday lives. The difference between these two theories is a tiny fraction of a percent of a result at the very far boundary of our ability to observe things. Uh, two examples of this. One is that if you look at the orbit of Mercury as it, uh, as it goes around the sun once every, I think, 88 days. And most of the time you expect, um, you expect uh, planets uh, as they orbit you know, the sun to complete a, you know, to, to, to complete a revolution uh, in, in, in uh, a period of time which does not change from year to year. But what happens with the orbit of Mercury, which is very, very odd and there was no good explanation for it, is that every time it, um, it completed the orbit, it was off by just a tiny fraction of a percent of a degree. Uh, it's called the precession, tech, the technical term for it is the precession of the perihelion of Mercury. So you know, every planet's orbit is not exactly a circle, it's actually a bit of an ellipse. And, you know, and, the, and the long axis of that ellipse is not, is not fixed in time, but that long axis of the ellipse itself rotates just a little bit every year. And the amount that it rotates is so small that you might think, if you're measuring the difference, you might think it was just an error in your, in your instrumentation. It's like a tiny fraction of a degree. But within that tiny fraction of a degree lies the whole difference between the predictions of Einstein's theory of relativity versus the prediction of Newton's theory of gravity. Completely insignificant. Um, uh, difference in, in observations. And a second example is um, also a very famous example, and this was made the front pages of the newspapers, I think in 19, what was it, 18, when there was an eclipse, a total eclipse of the sun. And at this time, Einstein's theory of general relativity was known, uh, and people were starting to make predictions from it. And one of the predictions was that gravity bends light itself. And the most massive object around uh, is the sun. And so, well, gravity ought to bend light around the sun just, just by a, a little bit. Um, but normally you can't see light, like starlight, behind the sun because the stars are totally washed out by the light of the sun. And so you have to wait for a total eclipse to be able to see those little the, the stars, which might be um, just, uh, just uh, outside the edge of the disk of the sun. Uh, which are only visible during a total eclipse. And if that starlight is slightly bent by the, by the, um, by the gravity, by the gra gravitational well of the sun, then the position of that star would be slightly changed from where you expect it to be. And of course, any other time, you know exactly where you expect that star to be. So during a total solar eclipse, you look up in the sky and you look for that star that you know is going to be there and you see, oh, it's shifted just a little bit. According to Newton's laws, there should be no change whatsoever in the position of that star. But according to Einstein's theory of general relativity, there is a slight change. Again, a change so small that you have to try really, really hard to find it. Uh, it's a you know, tiny fraction of a degree again. So here's two cases where you have two completely different theories that tell you completely different things about the nature of space and time but they describe what are, to all intents and purposes, an almost identical set of observations. So what can we, what, what can, can, can we, can we draw from this? One thing we draw from this is well, the curious result that theories may be really good in one respect, you know, get almost all the, you know, the observations all right, but they can nevertheless be completely wrong in their assumptions. And one result of this is, <coughs> I think, a very helpful thing in, in both science and we'll see in religion, is a sense of humility about the enterprise. You know, because scientific theories, one knows scientific theories are never final, they're always provisional, they're always open to falsification. We may think we have a great theory, and it may in fact work really, really well within its particular domain of application, but it may break down utterly beyond that domain. So the, 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 the viewpoint that, that arise, uh, arises from this is that all of our physical theories of the world are models. They're, they're like maps of reality. You know, they're useful for the purpose for which they're created, but every map breaks down at some point. 
We're all familiar with the old Mercator projection of the Earth, which works really great at the equator, but as you get farther and farther away from the equator towards the poles, the map breaks down. It, the, 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 the distances become stretched and land masses take on vastly more areas than they have in reality. So just like those maps of the physical, um, of the physical Earth have certain limitations and break down at certain points, so also do our uh, other theories of reality in other ways. What if we apply this insight, this powerful insight, this humbling insight uh, about the physical world and our understanding of the world to our concept of religion and our idea about the spiritual realities which lie behind all of our theories and ideas of religion? Because if this principle of uncertainty and humility applies to our understanding of the physical world, where things are measurable, at least, and we can come to objective agreement about what's a correct theory and what's a wrong theory, how much more should it apply to the metaphysical or spiritual world to which we have no direct observational access, and which all our ideas, in any case, are our theories. You know, they're, they're models, they're ways of understanding an essentially invisible uh, and in, uh, what, what we take to be an invisible sector of, the, uh, of, the, of reality uh, that we have uh, no direct access to. So what if we think of every theology of every religion, um, from ancient religions up, up to our own, ultimately as models or approximations? Um, and, and that even a model that is mostly right uh, and and a, a theological theory is right, not in the scientific sense that it, that it um, provides scientific predictions of the universe, but the, theological models are right in that they work. They're right in that they solve problems. They're right in that they improve the, the situation of the human, right, uh, human race. It's possible that these theological models can be right in the sense that they are remedies for the illnesses of particular ages, even if, like Newton's theory, they can nevertheless be wrong in the sense of the, the, um, the, the, the fundamental entities or spiritual realities which they purport to describe may be completely different than what they seem to be in the model. Like so, as an example, yes? Like like reincarnation, you know, there's one sense in which there's truth behind that. There's truth that there's certain repeated patterns in history. Baha'u'llah talks about them in the Kitab Yigan. You know, the return of the prophets, the return of their followers, the return of the deniers of the prophets. You know, that's a, a kind of a reincarnation, perhaps not in the sense of the people understand it in, in Hinduism, but there's a, you know, a sense of, uh, of return. So there's truth to that idea, but at the same, at the same time, uh, in, in another sense, uh, maybe it's not true. Maybe another example of this, you know, we, we know that God is beyond understanding. It, we take it as an axiom of our faith that God's essential attributes are unknown. So if that's the case, then our every conception of the divine must necessarily fall short. Every attribute we want to ascribe to God, be it the unity of God, or the existence of God. Even these words are ultimately pale shadows of the ultimate reality of things. Abdu'l-Baha says in some answer questions that the divine reality is sanctified beyond singleness, then how much more beyond plurality? Uh, these are difficult concepts to wrap one's head around when one is, when one, you know, for one's whole life has thought of, you know, God is one, man is one, all the religions are one, as being you know, fundamental axioms. But in a way, the idea that God is one is like the Newtonian approximation. You know, it's perfectly true and correct until you actually get to the edge of the map. And then, well, even the idea of oneness doesn't properly describe that ultimate reality. So this is an, an example of a theological conception, monotheism, which is very neat and tidy, uh, very easy to understand, very compelling, has formed the, the, the foundation of the Judeo-Christian Islamic worldview. But this neat and tidy conception of the divine is not shared by every, every religious um, 
communion on the planet. You know, the, the, the religions of the, of the East don't share this same sense of monotheism. So what are we to do with this? Are we, and, and how are we to proceed into the future with this? Uh, is there some battle of theologies and one of them wins? Uh, and those who, uh, who ascribe to the non-monotheistic theologies at some point toss in their hands and say, we were wrong, uh, and this is, the, this is the only correct way of conceiving of the divine. Or following the tablet to Manichi Saheb, where Manichi Saheb proposes to Baha'u'llah these four different ways of looking at the world, pantheism, theism, and deism, and atheism. And Baha'u'llah doesn't say one of these is right and the others are wrong. He says, one of them is closer to piety, sort of chooses the word carefully. And he said, but there's a justification for the other schools as well. So this, this opens up to our minds the idea of there being a kind of a theological openness, not so open that any old idea goes, but the idea that there are a, a subset of, of relevant ways that nevertheless may be drastically different from each other. And, and there is a way for us to come together and live in harmony and act in harmony and be, uh, and be a unified humanity while, while nevertheless retaining certain differences, even at the sort of ground floor theological level that previous to this could never have, have been compatible, could never have existed concurrently. In fact, which wars have been fought over and people have fought and killed over these, over these theologies. And Baha'u'llah is suggesting, well, actually, maybe we shouldn't be fighting and killing each other over these theologies. Maybe each of them is correct within their own particular point of view. So, so it's in this light that we're looking at um, a big picture view, a big picture sort of metaphysical view of the world. Um, and we're asking, well, what is behind everything? What is behind this, this realm of appearances? Um, and the problem, as we mentioned, is that we have no access to the invisible realm, which we are presuming to say something very precise about. But that doesn't stop us from wanting to know. It doesn't stop us from wanting to understand and from, and from having our, our, our theories about it. And indeed, throughout human history, both recorded and no doubt into prehistory, human beings have thought about the divine in, in very different ways. Perhaps originally through the form of, of stories told over campfires, over the eons, which elaborated over the vast stretches of time become pantheons of gods embodying different forces of nature, um, which ultimately are identical to, to spiritual forces. With the first axial age around 200 to 800 BC, these spiritual ideas, these very concretized uh, pantheons of gods become abstracted, and the narrative of monotheism emerges around this time across uh, a number of cultures uh, nearly simultaneously. But today, the secular world has witnessed the failure of the religious systems based on the spiritual insights of the first axial age, the spiritual insights of the religious systems that are founded on, on these specific ideas of the divine, whether monotheism or not monotheistic or non-monotheistic. And so belief in these, in, 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 the, in the gods as described in these past religions is no longer possible for many. Now, most of the writings, we should say, uh, and acknowledge that most of the writings of the Baha'i faith are written very clearly in the narrative language of monotheism and sit very comfortably with the, 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 the sacred writings of Islam, of Christianity, uh, and of Judaism. But is that a result of this being the ultimate reality of things, or is this a result of the population to whom Baha'u'llah was addressing, and a result of their own limitations and their own needs? As Baha'u'llah himself describes, he is the divine physician, and he's administering the remedy, which is commensurate with the, with the sickness uh, of the age uh, in, in which he has come. And uh, apart from this, Baha'u'llah is not excluding the other narratives, although his, his revelation is primarily cast in the form of the robust monotheism 
uh, of Islam and, 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 um, and earlier religions. Baha'u'llah, as we find in the Manuchi Sahib, and also in his hidden words, and in his seven valleys and other mystical tablets, is uh, some of which are not framed in that, uh, in that monotheistic language, but more framed uh, in, in, in language which is more consonant with the theological conceptions of the East. As Baha'u'llah himself says, this is the tree which is neither of the East nor of the West, describing his own, uh, his own revelation. And so, and so there may be different ways of encountering and understanding and describing the invisible world beyond the senses, ways that are different from the, the traditional narratives that we are accustomed to coming from our Christian, uh, primarily from our Christian and Jewish and Islamic uh, backgrounds. And so what, we'll, what we're offering uh, and, and try to sketch some outlines of today is in the spirit of a model, in the same sense that there's a models of, of different physical processes, um, but a model or a theory which is to be evaluated based on pragmatic criteria, um, meaning to ask, is it scientifically true, is not the most helpful question. Although it has to be compatible with science, it can't run fly in the face of, of the facts of the universe as are understood by science. But there are an infinite number of metaphysical theories that one could devise that are compatible with science. And so most relevant, the most relevant question to metaphysical narratives and models is, does it work? Meaning, does it help tie things together? Does it make ordered sense out of the apparent disorder of the universe? Does it improve human life? Does it have predictive power? So our brief intro to, to, to history, uh, all too brief intro to, to history in, in the last two sessions began with the birth of the human, with the emergence of abstract thought, which may have happened around 100,000 years ago. But the history of consciousness is, goes stretches much farther back than this we could actually stretch it all the way back to the moment of the Big Bang. Why can we do this? Well, let's take Baha'u'llah's statement in the Kitabi Akhtas. This is the changeless faith of God, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. Uh, and let's read that for the moment, literally. Let's say he, he doesn't just mean throughout human history it's been changeless. You know, let's take eternal in the past, eternal in the future as, uh, as meaning what, what, it, what it says at, at face value, which is, the faith of God has been changeless, even, it has not changed even before there were human beings on the planet to, um, to recognize it and embrace it. What form would that changeless faith of God have taken prior to the emergence of conscious humans on the world scene about 100,000 years ago? What form would it have taken in the primordial seas of a billion years ago? when the only life on the planet were unicellular, uh, uni unicellular creatures you know, floating in the sea. The changeless faith of God is still operative there. What form does it take? It doesn't take the form of a book and of laws and of religious organizations. It takes a different kind of a form, but it's the same essence as it is today. What is the essence of that cha changeless faith? And before answer, trying to answer that, we, we have to have the, whatever the answer to that is, has to be the same answer if we roll the clock backwards even farther to say billions of years ago before there was even life on planet Earth. Maybe even 13 or 14 billion years ago before there was even life in the universe. The changeless faith of God was still there. It was still operating. What form did it take? Um, I'll propose an answer to that. Uh, and the answer ultimately is of what Baha'u'llah himself says, it's love. Um, not, not human love, well, it includes human love as a subset of the broader concept of love, which operates at all levels of creation, from the mineral kingdom through the, the plants and animals into the human kingdom and beyond. Baha'u'llah puts it specifically in the following words, that know thou that in every age and cycle, all laws and ordinances have been changed according to the requirements of the times, except the law of love, which like a fountain ever flows and whose course never suffers change. This is uh, from a tablet of Baha'u'llah translated by, by Shoghi Effendi. But love for what? If we're talking 
five billion years ago, the changeless faith of God is still operating on a lifeless planet. What does love for God mean on a lifeless planet? Well, at the elemental level, love is the attraction of elements for each other. It is the force of gravity itself, which from the opening moments of the Big Bang acts towards the upbuilding of matter. It brings things together. Gravity pulls things together. It creates and fashions the stars and the planets and the galaxies, which are the physical substrate upon which higher degrees of consciousness can emerge. And so on, all the way up the, up the, the chain of being from the earliest life forms to the most advanced life forms. Each, each substrate, each, uh, each uh, level of consciousness, each, each degree of creation acts as a foundation for the appearance of still higher degrees of consciousness. Um, and it is through higher degrees of love that enable those higher degrees of consciousness to emerge. Yes, we have a question. So, but doesn't, I mean, go back to the big thing, that's awesome, I like that part. But what about the possibility of, you know, God's children exist in another kind of universe? Ah, we're getting there. Okay. We're absolutely getting there, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm not, yes, I'm, that's going to be answered, yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting that, that you bring this up about love because it's the rishis in India uh, that had said when it's all said and done, it gets down to that vibration of love. Right. Well, this is the, I mean, as Baha'u'llah says, this is, this is not a unique teaching of his, of his revelation. I mean, this is something that has appeared in every religion of the past. It's, a, it, it's truly the, the, the fountain that, uh, that is ever flowing and, 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 uh, and is ever replenished. Yes? Uh, maybe the Big Bang doesn't actually exist. Is that might be a human creation. Because Baha'u'llah says yes. the creation has always existed. Yes, so I'm, I'm bracketing that because that's, that's a whole other side conversation, but the, the Big Bang, as far as science knows, it, it can't extrapolate any farther beyond the 13 or 14 billion years in the past that the Big Bang theory is operative. No one knows, and there are many theories, interesting theories, that, um, that would, I think, take us too far afield, that, you know, that maybe there are other universes in parallel to this universe, maybe the Big Bang wasn't the beginning, maybe it's a, a cyclical, bangs and crunches, um, no, nobody knows at this point. The state of, of our science is, is, is not sufficient to answer that question. We do know that Baha'u'llah says, in a, uh, a, along with other ancient philosophers, that the universe has no beginning. Uh, at the same time, in, in the tablet, Baha'u'llah says this is true. It's also true with what the scriptures say, that God created the universe from nothingness. It's one of these poles, you know, one of these pairs of poles which seem to contradict themselves. Yes, the universe was created from nothingness, Yes, the universe always existed. Uh, it's, a matter of, uh, it's a matter of perspective. So, so what is the thing that existed, the, the changeless faith of God that existed billion years, billions of years ago? Ultimately, it is the force of love. As Abdu'l-Bahá says in his Tablet of Love, uh, the entirety of which is selections from the writings of Abdu'l-Bahá number 12, selection number 12, it becomes Love is the Secret. It's one of his most beautiful tablets. And in the middle of this tablet, he says, Love is the most great law that ruleth this mighty and heavenly cycle, the unique power that bindeth together the diverse elements of this material world, the supreme magnetic force that directeth the movements of the spheres in the celestial realms. Love revealeth with unfailing and limitless power the mysteries latent in the universe. So what we're talking about is a metaphysics of love. And, the, and, and, the, and what love does is it brings together the elements into higher and higher degrees of complexity, and which then act as a foundation for the emergence of higher and higher forms of consciousness. What this does, by the way, incidentally, uh, and I think um, quite, uh, quite profoundly, is it takes what science describes and studies as physical evolution, both Darwinian evolution of life, uh, of life on this planet through the forces of, of, uh, of natural selection and the earlier evolution of the, you know, of, the, of the cosmos as described by the science of cosmology. And it weaves those in seamlessly with what 
we call you know, the, the evolution of the spiritual world or progressive revelation from the perspective of the Baha'i teachings. And so there's really a seamless transition or, or process from the evolution of the physical world to the evolution of life on the planet to the spiritual evolution of consciousness as embodied in, in human realities on this planet. And as we know, uh, the, the Baha'i writings are, are clear, and we'll come to this point in a little bit about the existence of life elsewhere as well. So the ultimate purpose then of love, of, of, of gravity, of electromagnetism, of all the forces that, that, that we are aware, then is the appearance of consciousness. And this is taking us back to that statement by the House of Justice that we quoted on the first day about recasting the very conception of religion as the principal force impelling the development of consciousness. In that sense, we are a way for the cosmos to know itself. To quote a famous line by Carl Sagan, our coming to consciousness is part of the destiny of the cosmos, part of the purpose of the universe, is our coming to know ourselves. Because as one of the Islamic hadith reads, he who hath known himself hath known his Lord. So the emergence of self-consciousness is identical with the knowledge of God. So, um, so we have this, this, this picture then of time stretching back very far, not necessarily infinitely far, but very far indeed. And we have this idea of this evolution of consciousness up until the present day and then moving into the future into this as yet unrealized maturity uh, of, of the human race. And so we're looking at this progression as though it were linear, as though it starts from uh, a very simple uh, stage and then ends in a very uh, complex stage. Uh, but following the analogy of childhood and maturity and adolescence, uh, what comes after maturity? Old age and death. We usually drop that part of the analogy. <laughs> but Abdu'l Baha doesn't drop that part. And in one of the chapters of Some Answered Questions, he talks about time not being linear on the largest scales, but being cyclical, which implies old age and death on the part of civilizations, even our own. So this is how he puts it. I'm, I'm afraid this may be from the older translation of some answer questions, but it's the same idea. He says, for the whole universe, whether for the heavens or for men, there are cycles of great events, of important facts and occurrences. Cycles begin, end, and are renewed until a universal cycle is completed in the world, when important events and great occurrences will take place, which entirely efface every trace and record of the past. Then a new universal cycle begins in the world, for this universe has no beginning. This is a bit difficult to take in, because we're, you know, whatever happened to the day which will not be followed by night, Whatever happened to this idea of, you know, the, 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 the golden age basically stretching into eternity? Well, any suitably large uh, process, uh, any suitably long cycle, when viewed on any reasonably even, you know, long period of time, may look like, may look linear. You know, zoom in on a circle enough and it looks like a line. Uh, and I think that's what, that, that's what we're looking at. You know, we can, because we're... The cycles that we're talking about, you know, the universal cycles, we don't know exactly how long they are, but we know, astronomically speaking, uh, they're on the order of billions of years. You know, the universal cycles that are mandated by the laws of physics are those cycles that govern the life, the lifetimes of stars. Uh, and stars tend to burn their nuclear fuel out within a few billion years. You know, maybe the, the most long-lived stars, you know, longer than, than 10 billion years. But we're talking on the order of billions of years, which is so vastly larger than the timescales of human civilization that we're aware of a few thousand years in terms of written history. And, you know, as we've been discussing, maybe we can go back 100,000 years if we talk about, um, you know, the earliest evidence of, of cave paintings and, and Neolithic burials and so forth. But, you know, a, a billion years in comparison with 100,000 years, we're talking about so many orders of magnitude. We might as well just call it Linear. We might as well just think of it as, as linear. Um, but it remains that at the largest scales, if we're trying to paint this picture, what's the big picture of things? You know, what is our sort of metaphysical story? What is our new narrative that, uh, 
that uh, complementing the narrative of the Judeo-Christian Islamic you know, prophets being sent every thousand years uh, and the eternal covenant of God. What is the new narrative which embraces this old narrative, which lo looks at it from a different angle as though you know, the, the particle uh, viewpoint and, and the wave viewpoint. Um, and that is the idea of the circle of existence. That existence is cyclical, history is also cyclical, of course, this is not our intuition of things. We think of history as linear, and to an approximation, just like the Newtonian approximation, we can talk about history as linear as long as we're talking about it on the time scale of, let's say, millions of years or less. Um, but we already know that it can't, that history and progress cannot be constants because exponential processes cannot continue indefinitely. And on this planet, growth has been exponential for a couple of centuries now. I mean, really triggered by the Industrial Revolution, you know, a famous example being Moore's Law in the power of, of computers, where computational power doubles every, every year and a half, uh, which has almost miraculously been maintained for the last several decades. The, this sort of exponential growth and the, and, the, and the changes that it has produced in civilization cannot go on uh, cannot go on indefinitely. There has to be some leveling off at some point. Hopefully not a crash, you know, hopefully a leveling off to a kind of a stable, uh, a stable period that we would call the golden age, that we would call the, the period of the maturity uh, of, of the human race. But the picture that emerges then ultimately on the biggest scale is of cycles, of a circle, of a circle of existence. Abdu'l-Baha actually talks about the circle of existence in one of the later chapters of some answer questions. He gives the image of arcs of ascent and descent. He says the universe is comprised, and this is how he puts it in some answer questions. This is chapter 81 in some answer questions. This is, I think, a key element of this sort of new narrative that we're trying to construct. He says, those who have thoroughly investigated the questions of divinity know of a certainty that the material worlds terminate at the end of the arc of descent that the station of man lies at the end of the arc of descent and the beginning of the arc of ascent, which is opposite the supreme center. And that from the beginning to the end of the arc of ascent, the degrees of progress are of a spiritual nature. The arc of descent ends in material realities and the arc of ascent in spiritual realities. So one can almost you know, create a, a chart of this where you have a circle and because it's already limited, you put God at the top of the circle or the emanative force, you know, the, the primal will perhaps at the top of the circle because God is, is detached and separate from all, from, 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 from all things, you know, theological speak, theologically speaking. But there's an emanative source. Uh, some call it the primal will and some call it the laws of nature. You know, Baha'u'llah says these two are the same. Uh, and, and, it, and that forms the, the top part of the circle. And then there's an emanative arc which reaches down uh, and creates a semicircle. And at the bottom of, of that circle is the human reality. Um, and then uh, the second ascending uh, arc comprises the different degrees of spiritual progress. So uh, all along this arc of existence, all along the circle, circle of existence, consciousness is being continually reborn, is reaching its culmination, and is receding back into the elements to be reborn again. It's very, it's, 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 it's a, it's a historical viewpoint, which I think is more, perhaps more in line with the, um, with certain Hindu conceptions of time than, than, you know, than Christian conceptions of time. The, the, what are they called? The yugas, or the, is that what they're called? Does anybody know the, the terminology? Uh, and, these, and these cycles in, in, in Hinduism, I think, are, are vastly long even, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions, uh, millions of years. So zooming in on history, it looks linear. Zooming out, it looks cyclical. The human reality is, is opposite the supreme center of the circle of existence. Meaning, and this helps us resolve a great conundrum uh, from the beginning of philosophy to the present day, what's the difference between material and spiritual? You know, we, we, we often think of the world as divided into a material world that we can see and touch and measure and this invisible spiritual world which somehow impinges on the physical world in a way we don't understand, but the best we can do is it's kind of an invisible layer of reality, and uh, th that's, where, that's where the angels are, that's where spiritual forces are. Um, so the circle of existence helps us recast our understanding of the physical and the spiritual. How does it do that? Well, at any point, 
one, uh, any, any individual consciousness exists at some point along the circle. For the human reality, we put ourselves at the, at, the, at the bottom of the circle. Now, the physical world and the material world is the arc of descent, and the spiritual world is the arc of ascent. Now, as we traverse the circle, whatever is behind us is whatever we call the, the material world, and whatever remains in front of us is whatever we call the spiritual world. So spiritual and material become matters of perspective. It's a matter of what direction are you looking along the arcs of ascent and descent, not what is fundamentally sort of there in a substance dualism sort of a sense. There are material realities and spiritual realities you know, in a very fixed, let's say, Newtonian sense. We have this more sort of Einsteinian, you know, subtle general relativity sense of, well, it's relative. What's spiritual and what's physical is relative to your point of view, just like what is space and what is time is relative to your point of view. So we have a, a new, different way of imagining the difference and, and, and perhaps helpful. Perhaps this can be a contribution to, 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 the di to present dialogues on science and religion. This new perspective on the difference between matter and spirit. It gives space to the non-dualities of the theologies of Eastern religions while at the same time justifying uh, and, uh, and giving a concrete reality to the dualistic conceptions of Western religions. Because although material and spiritual become matters of perspective, what direction you're traveling or, let's say, looking along the arcs of ascent and descent, it is still the case that material and spiritual are quite well defined from wherever you are. You know, material is one direction, spiritual is the other. You know, it, so dualism of a kind persists throughout this viewpoint, even though one understands in a larger sense that what's spiritual and what's material are relative. So the top level then purpose that persists through all of this is that the divine is coming into continuous self-knowledge and self-remembrance in infinite ways through the infinite creativity of the word of God, the logos, the primal will which is always and ever generously and abundantly creating infinitely and giving infinitely of itself. This is God's eternal yearning to be known and loved. To paraphrase another philosopher, this world is a whirlwind of creative energy without beginning, without end, a sea of forces flowing and rushing together, eternally changing, eternally flooding out, out of the simplest form, striving towards the most complex, and then with the turn of the universal cycles, again returning home to the simple out of its infinite abundance, out of the play of contradictions back to the joy of concord, ever desiring to know and to be known, to love and to be loved, ever circling back on itself in awakening self-consciousness, ever striving for higher expressions of the lower and returning to the lower from the higher. It is an ecstatic expression of the divinity that shines within all things and that rains down upon all things. In a word, the world is the will to consciousness and to love. It is accomplished through unity and we are all fragments of this will. Perhaps expressed most clearly with the fewest number of words in the short obligatory prayer that thou hast created me to know thee and to worship thee. And so we come full circle from an impersonal cosmic view of the universe to a personal view of a soul in relationship with its creator. And that will be the topic of tomorrow's session. Um, it's a paraphrase of, of something. It's, it's my own words, but it's a paraphrase, paraphrase from something else. I'll, Ask me afterwards. <laughs> As you have been talking about our consciousness and describing these different ways of looking at things, it occurs to me that when we become conscious of something, we try to find words, language, to express it with. As soon as we do that, we limit it. That's right. And as our consciousness grows, we have to find new language. Mm -hmm. But then again, we're limiting ourselves at each step, which is perhaps why we can never truly know 
God. Language itself is one of the greatest barriers to understanding. If only because language forces one to use words which grammatically take the position of nouns and verbs and adjectives and particles. And so a reality which may be continuous, which may not be resolvable into these discrete categories, which may not fit into these around peg, which may not fit into these square holes of our grammar. The moment we open our mouths and say, God is X, or the purpose of religion is Y, the moment we do that, or the nature of the soul or the afterlife is this, the moment we open our mouths, we have already done violence to the, to, to the, to the ultimate reality of things, which is beyond the power of words. Which isn't to say, well, one should just throw up one hands and be silent. Although one great philosopher, I think it was Wittgenstein, said, you know, of that whereof we have uh, no knowledge, you know, thereof we must remain silent. And, and there's some wisdom in that. But we're in the world, and we need to accomplish something in the world, and we need to rectify vast social injustices, and we need to improve the human condition, and we need to unlock human potentiality. And to do that requires us to make decisions, and to open our mouths and speak, and, and go through the messy process of figuring out what to do in this world. And to do that, we need words. Uh, and that means our theologies are, are, are necessarily going to be, uh, well, that they're going to be pale reflections of ultimate reality, which is why we need to allow there to be a multiplicity of these understandings, because the reality of things can never be compressed into one particular dimension. It's kind of like that uh, idea in the book six of being and doing and believing. Yes. Say more. Um, that's <laughs> Yes. Well, it's kind of like if you, if you can condense that statement of Abdul Baha's, it's very simple. Love makes the world go round. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> literally. Literally. Yeah, literally. Yeah. And then the, then the implications yeah. of this would be that attachment to the form or expression of somebody's belief or somebody's like state of alignment, if there are different totems and different schools of thought, each correct within their own sphere of, you know, mm -hmm. reality, then perhaps the focus of, with, to speak to your point about the being and doing thing, perhaps mm -hmm. it's less it's less important to build a collective consensus about how we each decide to believe in a thing and more important to figure out what the consensus should be on how to approach large large scale problems in mm -hmm. behavior and because there's such a diverse a diversity of experience the approaches will necessarily also be diverse mm -hmm. and so the the faith has to accompany or like uh, accommodate different different ways of understanding the divine and then also different paces and strides in dealing with the fundamental challenges mm -hmm. that affect humanity mm -hmm. currently. Mm -hmm. So, but along the same line, I think the issue that we often deal with when we talk about consciousness is apathy. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're engaged in this discourse of talking about what is consciousness and what do you believe in, it's wonderful that you can have this consultation and reflection. Mm -hmm. But when there is apathy in the world, you're sure. saying, well, I, I don't belong to this, mm -hmm. or I don't understand mm -hmm. it, or there is no love. Mm -hmm. And it's so polarized. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I don't think this only belongs to the outside world, just to make sure, sure. that we are very clear mm -hmm. about this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also talking about apathy within our own Baha'i community. Mm -hmm. then, then there is no discussion between that. Yeah. Then there's only just the, the, the manifestation of love. Yes? The, the Tao of Love too is wonderful in, in, in describing that the paradigm shifts from a definition in a language to reality. Is it, it's a mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. How does, how does intention fit into this? It doesn't. How does what fit into this? Attention. Attention? Intention. 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 How does it fit in? That's my question. You know, in the, in the evolution of consciousness, you know, a lot of what we do or 
see that we need to do, we have some intention. How does that, is that even relevant for yeah. it's, a, it's something that we shouldn't be doing in some fashion? I, I guess, yeah, to put that in even more sharper terms, uh, is there a value in sitting in one's chair and having wonderful thoughts and feelings mm -hmm. about other people? Is there value in that? Absolutely. Without those wonderful thoughts and feelings ever becoming manifest in actions? It's a difficult problem. It's not, I don't think it's an ob obvious answer to it. I don't see how you could prevent that from translating into reality. <laughs> That's a great point. So, you know, one, one way to take this conversation is to say that, that if the intentions are true intentions and not just fleeting fancies, then they are necessarily connected to action. Otherwise, you know, they're otherwise they're not real intentions. That's why the prayer is there. Purify the motive of my conduct. Mm -hmm. Not just what I do, but the motive behind what I do. And what about actions that don't have the right intentions behind them? or have no particular intentions behind them, but happen to be the right actions. <laughs> what is the status of those? That's actually the subject of the final chapter in some answered questions <laughs> I refer you to. <laughs> yes. If yeah. your wish is sincere, God will deliver you from your perplexity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Kim. Yeah, well, we're, we're sort of touching on, um, on this notion of usefulness, and I find that useful way of looking at both science and religion because you know we've got, we've got these different schools of thought and mm -hmm. Baha'u'llah was saying well there's, there's these are correct in different ways and, and yet at the same time we're, we're saying well we can't ever really say that anything is correct or not mm -hmm. you know so probably the best we can do is say well is this useful or not and like mm -hmm. sort of what several of us have said recently just in the last few minutes is well how do we how do we come to some idea of what is useful? You know, because because clearly the tools of what brought humanity here today are not going to be things that are going to help us persist as a society going forward. Because those were tools that provided utility generally for the very few, and now we have to have this new consciousness of humanity that allows us to provide for all of us. Um, you know, so I think if you look at sort of these schools of thought within what's useful or not, it actually to me it helps bring some structure to that, because mm -hmm. each of those have provided utility to humanity at different times, sometimes for very long periods of time. They've provided stability and structure for humanity, whether that's a, you know, monotheism or, or different sorts of systems like that. But it not necessarily they correct or not, that's not as useful to me as more as like, well, what are the elements of these systems that have helped provide structure and stability to humanity? Yeah. And the same can be said of science as well. It's not so much is the theory correct, but how useful is it? it how useful is it? lend itself to predictability. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up. It's been, um, and, and just to mention one, if you're interested in, pers in, in pursuing a, a fantastic discussion of this, uh, there's a book by William James, uh, 1907, called Pragmatism, where, he, where he, he really delves deeply into this difference between is something true versus is something useful. And when it comes to metaphysical things, can we even really talk about is it true? Or should we really be changing our conversation to is it useful? And what is the place of humility in that? Yeah, well, that was a big, a big topic of, of today was, you know, the humility of, of the true, the true humility of the scientific enterprise is understanding that, that knowledge has no end and that one's models are never final. You know, that there's always a chance of, of a model, however beautiful and intricate and, and correct, being overturned by, by later observation. And, and shouldn't that also be our, uh, our approach to matters of the spirit, where, where what is true and what is false is, is even more subjective than it is in the scientific realm? You know, shouldn't hum humility be, be a, a, a sort of a, a note that sounded throughout this entire process? Why don't we go out and like enjoy the sunshine? <laughs> Thank you.